run your own race. That's a really good bit of advice that someone gave me once. You know, run your own race. Try not to tap into other people around you. Reassure yourself. And if you have to slow down slightly, do it. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who right now is probably driving around town, singing her favorite music at the top of her lungs, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for this special edition of the Running For Real podcast. Today, I'm coming to you on National Running Day. Now, I'm not sure if National Running Day is a thing around the world or it's just in the US, but either way, you know, it's a day to celebrate. So why not give you a bonus episode? And I thought I would bring on a member of Team Ice Cream. I'm going to be sprinkling in these bonus episodes now and again. So make sure you subscribe to the Running For Real podcast on your favorite podcast player so that these come directly to you. You don't have to search for them. You don't have to have me sending you blog posts. They will come right to your phone or player. That's the logistical stuff out the way. So today I thought I'd bring Evie on. Now, many of you would have heard my interview with Evie on the Run To The Top podcast. And, you know, it was a great interview. We talked about a lot of things. It was very casual. And actually, funny enough, this one was a bit more of a like serious, maybe not so much serious, but just kind of more of a um, getting helpful information for you. And just kind of, I think you're going to get a lot out of this and actually didn't go in the direction I expected it to. So we kind of talk about the winning mindset. We go through a race and all the kind of various mental breakdowns we tend to have and how to overcome them. We talk about why to share or not share if you are going through struggles. And of course, we cover No Watch Me. For those of you who know what that means, you will be chuckling a little to yourself. If you do not and you do have Facebook, I would encourage you to join the Facebook community. I will put a link in the show notes, which you will hear about in the episode. But that is enough from me. Let's go talk to Evie. Evie, my dear, dear, dear friend, I am so excited to welcome you to this special edition of the Running For Real podcast. How are you, my friend? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Tina, on your fantastic show. I am really well today. How could I not be? It's Friday. The weather in the UK is phenomenally beautiful. It's Mm. hot. And I mean, really hot. You know, it's mid-20s, which for us is at this time of year is really hot. So everyone's happy. Uh, the weekend's coming and I've had a good week and yeah, I'm really, uh, really looking forward to having a chat with you. <laughs> I'm hoping that you are enjoying the this, this summer because you you know this is probably oh, yeah. it, right? You, uh, <laughs> you got these few days and then it will be raining and cold the rest oh, of the year. Oh, no. No, I know. You know, if you look at last Saturday, it was, uh, I was swimming the river and it was, you know, 11 degrees okay, in the water and outside probably wasn't much uh, warmer than that and you know five days later and it's it's it is literally 28 degrees I think today it's mm-hmm. crazy mm-hmm. so yeah I am looking I am enjoying it making the most of it doesn't make it easy to stay inside and work though no, I have to say <laughs> although it's funny um people often say to me like oh you know what what is what is England like what is Great Britain like and I'll say oh you know there's a lot of similar things I said people are a lot more like pessimistic and kind of a bit down a lot of the time and I honestly think it's because the weather is so like gray and just like dreary that it like makes people feel that way but I know that whenever the weather is like it is right now everyone is like hi and it's just everyone's really just happy so I can only imagine what it's like right now oh you're right there's a complete contrast that is the other thing you know you see the culture that people just flip from yeah getting you know being quite within themselves and uh, you know, going from A to B, head down, not really talking, and and then the sun comes out, and everyone is just in <laughs> holiday mode, t-shirts yep. on. Let's go out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's great. <laughs> so for those of you who didn't listen to the Run to the Top interview or who don't know of you, I would encourage people to go back and listen to that episode. But maybe you can yes. tell the story of how we know each other, if you can remember, and then we can go from there. How we know each other? Well, we met through. How did we meet? I, oh. Yeah, it's been it's been a few years. Was it through runners? Was it through oh, the running Evie. magazine? 
Breaking my heart. Was it yeah, it was. I know. <laughs> No, we met through Running Fitness yep. at the time, mm-hmm. uh, but, which is now called Running Magazine. So mm-hmm. I'm a one of the editors of the magazine um, on a freelance basis. That's one of my hats. And I think I was doing a story on DNF or DNS yep. and you and another friend of yours, I think Sarah. Sarah Slattery, yep. Yes, you guys, uh, I contacted you and you were so helpful with comments. I mean, I, you know, you gave me fantastic perspectives, really good comments about whether it's better to have a DNS or a DNF. So it did not finish or it did not start. And uh, you wrote a long, you know, really well thought out in depth. <laughs> I don't know if it's well thought out. It's usually just a ramble. <laughs> you know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a good ramble and, you know, that was how we met and mm-hmm. we went from there. So yeah. we actually met here when you came over, but uh, I've been um, your sports psychologist for two years maybe mm-hmm. so two years mm-hmm. yeah so shared your journey of you know 2015-16 when you had you know a real roller coaster and you achieved you know, lots of your goals so that was a really exciting time for me to be able to share that journey with mm-hmm. you but thank you and and yeah we've become friends yep so. you've paid your uh your dues with that though with the amount of uh times you've had to talk me off the ledge with uh but I've been going a bit, Amy, I don't know what to do. I'm so stressed. Uh-huh. But one thing I want to uh, ask you is, I'm sure people are curious, as you mentioned it, what did you find about DNS versus DNF? Mm. The ultimate, I think the ultimate finding is that it's different for everybody. And what I found was that half of the people I talked to made a good point about if, you're, if you've got an injury and you in be listen to your body so intuitively you feel that you know what this isn't really going to be wise to go into a race uh, you make a decision not to start but it does depend on your goals and it depends on the type of race it depends on where you are with your training and also you know talking to some people some actually said that they prefer to make the decision to go into the race so start mm-hmm. and but they've talked through the fact that or they've thought through the fact rather that they will be okay if they have to stop and that was another key point. Think that through in your mind before you do start, if you decide to start the race. So be okay with the what if. What if I do have to stop? What if the injury gets worse? Go through those scenarios and think of the answer to those. If you're comfortable with that, you know, go ahead and, and follow through. So start the race. And what about if someone – so is is the only situation really when you should drop out because of an injury or are there any other – like should you drop out if there's something – mentally going on I mean obviously if you're sick maybe or like ill that's something wrong but are there any other situations where people should drop out well I think you know do that do that whole health check so go through the physical because actually a lot of the mental fatigue and the mental anxiety and and stress in a race can often be linked to something physiologically Mm. that is out of balance and a couple of coaches made that point to me when I was writing that article so do a body check, you know, have I had enough fuel? Have I had enough hydration? Is my pace off? Am I going too fast? Are my shoes comfortable? Do all of that first. And often you people find that actually I do need to have some fuel or I do need to just slow down a moment. I do need to have a drink. And then they do that and that then has a sort of knock-on effect uh, mm. for that mental stress that they're feeling. So that's really important to remember. Okay. But should they, you know, no, I, I think, you know, obviously injury – determine that for you but then you do have you know some people can run through pain uh, or have a a much you know the pain tolerance is a a scale isn't Mm -hmm. it and everybody's on that and again it depends on experience you know some people are experienced running with niggles you know we all have we all have niggles of sorts and again they vary on that scale of intensity you know should you run with a niggle is it a, a two out of ten is it a three out of ten have you seen your physician what do they think? What does your coach think? And sometimes you can while you're sort of managing that injury, but sometimes you can't. And if it's a really intense pain, then obviously you, I think you need to sort of stop and, and get that checked out properly. But yeah, I think mentally in a race, if you know, you're know you really, really overwhelmed and it's not going as planned and you're starting to become very, very stressed, the first thing I'll do is breathe because often people forget to do that when they're you know, worried, they, they stop breathing and that just makes, that makes your body worse. You tense up, mm-hmm. take a breath, you know, stop. If you have to stop, 
depending on the type of race. I speak with a lot of endurance runners and who, who take part in ultra events. Mm. And ultra running is a completely different journey from that of a, of a collegiate runner or, you know, a 10K runner. It's not really about the times. It's about the actual journey and the yeah. performance, you know, from A to B. It's not so much the time. So it is quite different for everybody. Not an easy one to answer. And what about like, let's say someone does drop out and they're feeling really bad about themselves, either through an injury or just, you know, had a weak moment and dropped out. Any thoughts for overcoming the kind of guilt associated with that? As I I know we tend to beat ourselves up. Like even if you did stop Mm -hmm. because of an injury, like, oh, you know, I didn't know what to do. I felt so bad. Like, did I do the right thing? Like, what would you Mm. say for that? Yeah, firstly, it's really important as I said before, when you when you go into that race, go through all of those scenarios in your mind that could happen and you don't want to focus on, oh, what if I have to drop out? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, have a mental plan and a mental strategy going into the race. So plan it, have your race strategy, and also have those contingencies. So if you if you have got an injury, for example, and there is a possibility that it could go either way in the race, the first thing to do is to ask yourself, why, what, what's your goal with the race? Is it important to do that specific race or could you do another one a week later? You know, is it a points-based race? Are you, is that a qualifier for anything? So that's important to think about. Secondly, ask yourself, will I be okay if I have to drop out? Because if you do that before you, you run the race and your answer is, yep, I'm going to be okay with it, then when it does happen, mm. You know, you still will have feelings of disappointment, sure, but you can then go back to where you before the race and say, well, actually, no, I made the decision that I'd be okay with this. I'm going to be okay with it. Draw a line under it and learn from it. You can always learn something from every race. And I've spoken to several colleagues and, you know, renowned sports psychologists who that's one of the first things they say. There's there's always something that you can learn from, you know, a DNF. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've run half of the marathon before you have to stop and you ran you ran well that's a half marathon that you ran well isn't it you know mm-hmm. even though you didn't complete the marathon that's still considered uh, something that you've done and, and you've done well so I think sit down accept that it is a disappointment and allow yourself to to feel that way and in terms of beating yourself up well you know you've got two choices haven't you you can either be upset with yourself and, and disappointed which is often an initial reaction. But you can also, as I said, learn from it and say to yourself, well, what can I take from this? And then reflect on that. What could I have done differently? And what can I learn Yep, the next time? Mm. Okay. Nope, that's helpful. Because I think that's something that isn't often discussed. And if you do feel that Mm. way, even if you do have to DNS, DNF, if you, you know, drop out for any other reason. So I'm glad we kind of talked about that. And one thing I wanted to ask you that I just realized I didn't do and I seem to be in a habit of forgetting to do this but I usually ask my guests for a fun fact or a hidden talent so do you have anything that you (laughs) can share that maybe you know maybe Grant your husband knows but you haven't ever like put it out there publicly that would be fun (laughs) for people to learn about um I used to well I used to do backup singing oh I didn't know that really (laughs) no yeah yeah, again it's not at any amazing national oh, level I don't know. Um, but, but locally I used to uh, cool. and my mum used to dress me in this little watermelon suit um one piece with flares watermelon? <laughs> like it, it's green <laughs> and it, I look like a watermelon basically I've never forgiven her for that will you send but us a photo like, to put on the show oh, notes? yeah sure <laughs> that'd be amazing <laughs> I have to find one <laughs> So singing in the shower is something I do quite a lot. That's the best time to sing, isn't it? Or in the car. Yeah, well, no, when you sound amazing to yourself. Yeah, I know. That's what I do. I turn it up so loud that I can't hear my own voice. And then I think I sound good. But... Exactly. You're, you're hearing the music. You're thinking, oh, I, am, I can sing in key. This is great. <laughs> I can sing like a man. I can sing like <laughs> high pitch. I don't know about you either. Yeah. Oh, I love singing in the car. And last time we spoke, Evie, I mean, you and I have talked since, but everyone else listening, um, you were working on your website and it's now mm. live. So maybe, you know, when you we first spoke, you were talking about how you'd become certified and you were yes. starting to build up your network and your community, I guess. So tell us about how things are going now. Well, it's it's really good. So I'm a sport and exercise psychologist for those of you who 
who haven't listened to the first interview with Tina yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've, uh, I've been a journalist most of my life and uh, my late 30s I retrained and did a psychology diploma here and then I did a master's in sport and exercise psychology and I'm now – I think technically the, the term is sport and exercise psychologist in training. So I have a supervisor and a, mm-hmm. a team of colleagues who are also part of my supervision group. And we get together every um, few months and share our, our experiences and reflect on, on our training. And, and so I'm working. Mm-hmm. It's really exciting. I have quite a few one-to-one clients at the moment. And, you know, I, I'm trying to do as much group work as I can and, and have as many different experiences as I can with with athletes, everyday exercises, so people who, you know, want to make healthy lifestyle changes and they need some help with behaviour change and creating new healthy habits uh, right through to athletes and helping them with aspects of their performance, you know, mental strategies for the nerves and, um, you know, the confidence and, and various aspects of their sport. Mm-hmm. So it's a very – I love my job because, A, the thing I really love about what I do is, and I don't really know if I do a lot, but I help. What I love is that I'll help you realize that you've got all the the answers and, and the tools for yourself. So mm-hmm. I help support you discover those and teach you some techniques, but you know, ultimately you, you do it for yourself. So for me, that's really powerful. And, you know, I can see the benefits when we've worked together and, you know, things are going well for you and for anyone else I work with. It's, it's so wonderful to, oh, yeah. to be a part of that, mm-hmm. you know? It's great. And you go so far above and beyond to like really uh, help and do the best you can. And it's just wonderful. And anyone listening, if you are you. looking for someone to work with, I cannot recommend Evie enough. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everyone knows by now how much I preach about how you've bet you were the one that, you know, really initiated the change of when I took all those big leaps last year. Mm-hmm. So uh, or the year before that. So everyone, everyone knows that. But one thing I wanted to you to talk about, Evie, um, so a few months ago you had me fill out a thing called a winning mindset and it was a really cool like I don't know just concept I guess to think about and I kind of enjoyed doing that and it was something unique that I'd never seen but I thought that's something that people can do pretty easily to kind of get them in tune with you know where where their mind is at so maybe you could explain that for everyone because I think they'll love it yeah that was was that the winning the winning wheel that winning feeling was that the one yeah that was it yeah so you you had like all the branches coming off the side yeah yeah Yeah, so it's a really it's there's you know a lot of background behind it and I can go into that um maybe I can send you some information that you know you can post for for your audience and readers but just in a snapshot of that is so for people who struggle in a race mentally um and have you know moments during the race where you know, they've done the training and they go into the race feeling confident, but perhaps it doesn't take much for their confidence to be knocked and feel, you know, that you're wobbling and you you, you need some help and mm-hmm. that you're you know, mentally, you need to, to refocus and, and be strong. So the winning feeling, the winning mindset, it's a really good exercise. You have a piece of paper, A4, you have yourself in the middle, little circle, so you have Tina, and then you have some branches off just arrows pointing off all around around you. And there's several different things you can do, but you think of a time in your training, in your career, it might be a race, it might not be. It might be during a training camp when you were sitting in the evening having dinner one, one day after a really good training day. The point is to pick a time where you felt really happy, really content, really confident with where you were, with your training and your performance and find that time. It's often, you know, associated with running, but not always. And then write down what that scenario was. So I was sitting trackside. I just had a really good session. The sun was shining. And write down everything that you remember about that time. So the sounds, the sights, the smells, you know, who was there. And so as much description as you can. And, you know, it might be a paragraph or two long. And then you read it to yourself. And Then on that piece of paper, pick a word or a phrase that you associate with that experience, and it could be cheering crowds, it could be in the zone, it could be basically words that resonate with you, Mm -hmm. that you feel remind you of that time when you felt confident, and you write those down all around your name. And, you know, there's no rule. They don't have to be many. There could could be three, but there might be more. There might be, you know, ten. And they don't have to be sentences, just a word or a phrase. 
and then look at that that winning wheel, that winning feeling, and read all of those phrases. And when you read each one, think why about why you've written that there. And oh yeah, that was that. that was, the sun was so 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 bright, and it was so warm that day. And I just remember feeling really great. It could be big grin, you know, because you couldn't stop grinning because you felt so happy. Mm-hmm. The, the key is the emotion that's tied to each phrase and that links So should that it make you. you smile even just saying the words that you write down? Like if you it write big you. grin, it should kind of bring a smile to your face or like the sunny day, bring a smile to your face because it reminds you of that memory. Is that how kind of strong you're talking about here with? At times, at times, but it might just be a feeling. You know, okay. you, you just feel it's a nice feeling. It could be a comfort. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a mantra that you use all the time that, that gives you confidence, but you remember it on that specific day because you've written it on your ankle or you've written it on your arm. Anything, it's very personal. So any word or phrase that you associate with that time. Mm-hmm. And the idea is to familiarise yourself with all of the phrases. And when you are training or racing, any time in your, in your running where you start to feel like you're wobbling mentally, think of one of those words. And the more you practice doing it, the more, you know, you'll you'll be able to link that emotion from that time where you felt confident back to that moment. And that's that's the aim of that, to sort of help oh, you uh, replicate that, that winning feeling, that wonderful content feeling and that confident feeling that you had back in that, at that time in that moment when you need it. Mm-hmm. Does that and, make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. And then would you mm-hmm. say that it would be good for people to maybe write those words on their arm as like mantras to say or is, yeah. is that kind of you, make it like it's not as effective when you need it? No, no, I think I think absolutely. In fact, my husband Grant, that's why I mentioned it just now, he was, um, he was telling me during a half Ironman or one of the marathons that he ran in recent years, he wrote – there's a race number, I think, of Emil Zapotec when he he won, you know, Emil Zapotec won the 5,000, the 10,000, the marathon. I mean, an incredible athlete mm-hmm. back in the day. is one of Grant's inspirational, you know, heroes really. And he had a race number, uh, which was quite well known. And, and Grant used to write that race number on his own ankle. Mm. And I said to him, oh, that's a great idea. And he said, well, I did. I used to write the race number, but I didn't always see it. But I, the fact that I'd actually written it, written it on my ankle, I knew it was there and that gave me comfort. So that was interesting. So you don't always have to see it, but the fact that you've gone through that process of writing it down, you know, you've linked that to a winning feeling. It makes you feel good. It could be a, a pre-race routine or ritual that you do. Um, but the point is it makes you feel good, gives you mm-hmm. confidence. So, you know, it works for you. Okay, cool. That's helpful. And then any other suggestions while we're talking about races? Like, let's say someone feels like, like exactly what you said, once those negative Mm. thoughts start, they kind of spiral out of control. Like any other suggestions on things that would be really effective for people to do either during the race or before the race? Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's quite, you know, personal for everybody. It's different for everyone. But, you know, the first thing I'd recommend is do that body check. So breathe, because often, you know, yourself, when you're racing, your mind starts to wander, you start to lose focus, you're distracted from how you're physically performing. And so breathing, being conscious, taking yourself to your breath, making yourself be aware of yourself, breathing deep into your diaphragm and feeling your breath going through your body. It has to have a a, a positive effect more than a negative effect. I think it must, it has to relax your muscles because Mm you, if you're breathing, you know, it's hard for them to tense up. And the, if they're not tense, you know, mentally you'll start to feel better. So the first thing I'd say is take a few deep breaths and, you know, depending on what it is that's worrying you, you know, we'll give me an example in a race, you know, a time where you felt really uh, mentally, you just, you're starting to really struggle. Does it happen in the middle or at the end of a race? Um, I'd say, I mean, I kind of talked about this in a few of my blog posts, which I'll put links to in the show notes about like Mm. mental versus like physical, like the freak outs, what I called them. But like, Mm. you know, I would always find like early in the race, like maybe in a marathon, it'd be at like mile eight or nine. It'd be like, oh, I have such a long way to go. How am I ever going to, ever going to finish this? So maybe start with that. Yeah, that's, uh, (laughs) yeah, that's, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Always thinking about what's ahead rather than what you've actually run or even just being in the moment. So try and really focus on where you are right now. And 
when you start to think like that, oh, gosh, I've got another 10 miles, it can really affect you, can't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, and then you you realise what you have done. You think, oh, I'm not even halfway through. And so those thoughts, they can be really detrimental to your performance. So I would advise to, to breathe and tell yourself, I'm okay, you know, I've got this. And take yourself back to your training. You know, I've always said that to you. You've, the facts are there. The, the reality is that you've done the training and it's brought you all the way through that journey to the start of that race and you're fit, you're ready, you're doing it. Mm-hmm. So I would think of that because that can give you confidence. I've done the training. I've done my homework. I can do this. I can get through this. You know, reassure yourself. Okay. Because no one else will. If you can't reassure yourself, no one else can. No, that's helpful. You know, you've got to believe in yourself. And then also if it's a big event, you've got the crowds. Mm. But some people do find that distracting. How do you find that? Do you find if you're you know, having a, a mental, a bit of mental uh, stress that the crowds are more distract, more of a distraction or they're actually more of a comfort? Because I've had people that have said both. Um, I mean, the two situations mm-hmm. I can think about crowds are London mm-hmm. and in both situations it helped. But I mm-hmm. kind of, if it was early in the race, I would say to myself that I was taking their energy and I was going to put it in my pocket and save it for later. And so I, I would kind of use that, like say I was going to That's use their energy, shit. but, or I would imagine I've mentioned this many times before, like in my last marathon, I would imagine mm-hmm. that, um, the people in the crowds were, you know, you guys listening, like people who support me and want me to do well. And I'd kind of imagine it was like my community, my tribe, like around me, and they were the ones cheering. And, and so every time anyone was like, go oh, on, I was like, oh, they're cheering for me. And it, and they are. And that's one thing I think we often forget as runners is that if these people are clapping their hands or they're cheering, they are cheering for you. Like Absolutely. they might not know your name, but they are cheering for you. They are taking their energy and putting it into clapping or whatever. So, yeah, I think that definitely is a is a good one to think about. It's a really good tip. And and that's the other thing, you know, you can also runners out there, you can put your name on your t-shirt. And mm-hmm. I've found that to be really effective because people will call out your name, mm-hmm. you know, looking strong, Evie, fantastic, great running. You know, that's been shouted out. And that really gives, gives me a, a confidence boost. Yep. It really does. It's almost like that fuel injected energy. Yeah, that yeah, you yeah. Need. So, so then I want to kind tip. of move on. So with Let's keep going with with a race. So we mm-hmm. said maybe a third of the way through the race, you have your first like, oh God, I've got a long way. Mm. So then what about like just after halfway, we usually have a bit of a panic thinking I'm already mm-hmm. tired and I'm only halfway. Mm-hmm. What should someone do then? So I would, again, congratulate yourself that you've done this, you've gone this far. This is great. I've, wow, I've actually, I've done this, I've done, you know, 16 miles or what is it, 13 of a, of a marathon, a half marathon. You've got through that. And again, do a body check. I feel great. Okay, I'm tired. Yes, you know, but I can do this. I've done the training. I can do this. The crowd are with me. And think of your social support too. That's another good thing. You know, your coach, for you, that's Steve. Think of your friends that support you. Think of your family who are in that crowd somewhere or at the end of the race, you know, your children. And, you know, run your own race. That's a really good bit of advice that someone gave me once, you know, run your own race, try not to tap into other people around you, reassure yourself. And if you have to slow down slightly, do it. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's not the end of the world. It Mm -hmm. means that it could help you start to feel calm, get that breath going, slow down just a little bit, reassure yourself you can do this. Think of your training that you've done. And then also, you know, you can break up that what's left into into shorter sections. So you can say, right, I've only got two miles before I have some nutrition or have have some more water. That's great. I can do this. So break it up into smaller sections. Yeah, I found that Mm. helpful to break it up into like threes. Mm. Threes, yeah. Like three mile chunks or 5K Mm. chunks. And then that's why I used the whole mental bottles thing that we talked about with. That was a fantastic idea. Yeah, Yeah. which I guess I can explain that now for anyone who doesn't know. I will put a link in the show notes. Um, for telling you how, and those are going to be at tinamuir.com forward slash EV. And then we'll do EV one, two, three, four, five, however many of these Uh we do. So Uh tinamuir.com forward slash EV. So yeah, I did what I did for California International, which EV kind of gave me the 
seed that helped me use it but actually it was mm-hmm. it was helpful was i picked <laughs> i picked every 5k i would dedicate to someone else or a group of people so the first 3 miles of the race i dedicated to what i called my fans which is you guys listening all the people that have wished me good luck or people that you know or whatever whoever it may be and then i think the next 3 miles i did to my friends like at home and people that have known me who know me outside of running. And then I did my family and then I did, um, I'm trying to think who else I did. Uh, I don't know. I went through, Evie was one, Drew was one, Steve was obviously Steve. one. And uh, myself was the last one. And I found that help really helped because it just maintained my like mental focus for three miles to keep saying like, like the easiest one for me to remember is Drew's one. I kept saying, Drew made me strong. Drew made me strong because mm. Drew is my strength training coach. So it was like easy for me to keep repeating, Drew made yeah. me strong for three miles, but it didn't, it wasn't a whole race. So it wasn't, it didn't get old. So like yes. the first one, it was, um, and each, each one had like a, a word, a word that I could use yeah. or a phrase that I could use. Like your one was brave, brave I think. Yeah. Brave. brave. So I kept yeah. saying, be brave, be brave, be brave over and over again. And so I found that really helpful, like you said, kind of breaking it up and mm-hmm. then saying, okay, well, I've got, you know, two miles left of be brave and then I get to do another one kind of thing. Mm. So um, I called that mental bottles and I found that really helped. And it's kind of like what you were saying about breaking it up. And um, yeah, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, a lot of athletes do that. They break out that from halfway, uh, particularly, you know, whether it be checkpoint to checkpoint or as you did the three miles, some people it's two miles, whatever works for you. But, you know, making those shorter goals, as soon as you you get to that that three-mile point, you feel confident because mm-hmm. you've achieved it. And, yeah. and you're, you've also run three miles without really thinking about it yeah. and it stops you thinking about, oh, I've got this much left of the race, which can draw your energy away from you, mm-hmm. you know, drain you almost. So it's definitely a good strategy. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to try that and does try that, let me know. Okay, so next yeah. bit, let's say when you physically start to kind of unravel. So let's say like three quarters mm-hmm. of the way through, your body is like shutting down. You know, you can mm-hmm. say to yourself, oh, I've only got to get two miles, but then you think, well, I can't even make it two miles. I can't even make it to the next. I, all I can focus on is to getting to the next like light post on the side of the road or something. So mm-hmm. what about when you physically start to break down, really struggling? Mm-hmm. Really struggling again, breathing, because breathing can relax you. And I would focus on one part of your, this is, this is mental, but also physical. So start to focus on your body in separate parts. So think about your head. Um, and feel that try and try and relax your head and your neck um, and smile try and relax your jaw think of your shoulders and yeah these are really tense but I can just relax them a little bit more you know go back to when you've trained and you were you you had really good form in your training and try and replicate that you know with your legs take your mind down to your your core are you upright are you using your core is your footfall the best it can be you know if you have to slow down a little bit in order to regain your form, then, you know, you do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your hands, and often I find this, I don't know whether you do this, you know, a marathon's a long way, and if you're in the same position for a long time, you can get quite tense Mm. and almost get cramps. And often people complain of sort of nervy, numb shoulders and sort of high upper arms. So loosen them, you know, stand, I'm standing up now, but relax them, sort of shake your arms out and then get them back into that running position and then breathe and tell yourself, I'm okay, I can do this. In training, it gets hard and I'm always feeling good at the end of this training and I know that, you know, I'm strong. Again, draw on the people around you who have who have helped you get to that point. So yeah. for you, it was Drew, your strength coach. Think of all of that conditioning work that you did, you know, all of the good nutrition that you followed and, you know, even down to the cross training you've done, mm-hmm. all of that has combined to help you get to that point in that race. Okay. So yeah, go through your body and even your feet, try and feel your feet relax a little bit. It is really hard and, and it is quite intense, you know, the end of a marathon and, and often you're trying to give yourself that burst and go a little bit quicker. It is quite intense, but you know, if you're reassuring yourself, I think is the key and going really in, into yourself and focusing and that mantra that you've got, you know, for you, it's, it's be brave, be brave. Um, another one of yours was endure, I think, you know, endure or maintain, maintain. Yeah. So something that's rhythmic, something that you can follow 
with your footfall. So there's a tempo to it. Oh, okay. That can often be really helpful as well. So mm-hmm. mantras. Yep. No, that's great. And then one more before we move on to, I want to talk a bit more about just general running motivation and stuff. Mm-hmm. But so what about if someone is thinking to themselves, has got to the point where they're like, why do I do this? Like, I, I don't know why, I'm, why I bother. This hurts so much. This is so uncomfortable. Like maybe it's like mm-hmm. a mile to go or maybe a bit further than that but like at some point I could see like 23 miles of a marathon or so, or like a mm. you know 10 miles of a half marathon why do I do this why do I put myself through this what what do you say then so I think it's it's a really good point and it's really important for those that are new to running or those that have been running for a long time think about why you run and the purpose behind your running because often runners will say well I want to start running I want to you know lose a few pounds or I want to raise money for a charity that my friend's Mm -hmm. running for, raising money for, and they start running and that's great. But you've got to, you've got to really understand what's motivating you to do, to do what you're doing. So it could be that you want to lose weight, but it could be because you want to be a lot healthier because you want to be, you know, a good mentor and role model for your children. And you want to be able to be fit as you get older and have fun with your family. So linking that, greater purpose almost your why is really important as a runner and and the reason for that partly is because when you get to that point in the race where you're starting to question why this is so hard this is painful why don't why am I doing this you'll know why you know because you've thought about it before Mm -hmm. you have a very clear understanding of why you you've taken that decision to be a runner so it's 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 not something that people think about very often and it sounds obvious but actually when you sit down and really Think about why do I run? Not because I love it. Yes, but why do I love it? Because it makes me feel good mentally. Mm. I feel confident. And you can draw on all of those reasons when you need to at that point in the race where you you really need to to give yourself that motivation and that confidence. Okay, that's really helpful. All right, let's go something a little bit on a different tangent and then we'll go back Mm. to, I want to ask you about like losing running mojo, but as that was quite a lot Mm. of information in one go. So something I didn't mention to you that I was going to, talk about this but something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is so Mm. I mean you know this everyone listening knows this I've shared my story and what I've been doing you know stopping running gaining weight trying to get Mm. my body functioning again and you know I I feel like I've handled the weight gain and the change in lifestyle of not being a runner pretty well and for me I kind of like cut it off suddenly Mm. and just stopped running and it was fine but you know a lot of people have been surprised by that do you think that is a personality thing and my personality is just okay with like all or nothing? Or do you think that everyone can adapt to a big life change pretty easily or does it depend on the person? Just a, I was just curious. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a good question. I think, I think both. I think, you know, I know you and know your personality and you are, yeah, all or nothing. You put your heart and soul into everything you do. And so to make that decision to take a break from running, for you was, you know, it took you, you know, it was a big decision. Mm -hmm. And I think once you made that decision, you know, you had other things going on that you were focusing on. And also you, you did have a a reason, you know, you didn't really know why you wanted to do it. So, you know, in your case, I mean, it is amazing. You know, that transition has been remarkable. However, you do write a lot. And and that's the other thing. Writing is really therapeutic. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. That was was the second thing I was going to say. So for (laughs) me, writing has been therapeutic so yeah. would you encourage people to kind of share their struggles or is it, again, another thing that depends on the person? Like let's say someone is going oh. through an injury and they're feeling really down and they don't want to talk to friends and family because they'll kind of be like, it's just running, like get over it. Would it help to kind of share with the community or is this something where it really depends on the person, whether it's actually going to benefit you or not? Oh, yeah, I think that's a really personal choice and I I – you know, for me, I think talking about it and sharing it, if you're comfortable doing that and it makes you feel better, is can be really healing. Uh-huh. But you might, you know, you might write, you might get a journal, a diary, and write a letter to your community, you know, but not, not post it. Mm. Just the actual process of writing it and getting it out, being able to read it can be so beneficial because often you have all these thoughts going on in your head all of that emotion goes round and round and round. But when you put it out on paper, it's there, it's over there, it's it's out of sight. Yes. You separated it from your mind in a way that you're then able to read it and to just maybe understand it and accept it more. So, mm-hmm. so I think journal writing is really good. 
and I'd recommend anyone to do that, you know. Yeah. And sometimes people talk to people they don't know, you know, someone in their running group or their running community and they feel that they can trust. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I think it's a good idea to share it. Okay. You know, but blogs, but online running is, is huge now and I think lots of people – have virtual running friends. Mm-hmm. Actually, I've just written about this um, in an article and you know, you've got your real running friends, human running friends, and then you've got your online community, one of the social networks, but they can often be just as important to people as yeah. their real friends, yeah. you know? So, and that's what I've been enjoying with the running for real yeah. community, which I know you're in and all the yeah. superstars I have in there and anyone listening is welcome to join if you are interested and I'll put a link in the show notes, but yeah, I, I definitely agree um, with everything. Your running family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can see your whole face just lit up when you said your your running community because it, it is your family. Mm-hmm. You know, you love them and yep. they mean a lot to you, and you trust people. And also, the more you share about yourself, the more people get to know you mm-hmm. and you know your personality, and and that builds a relationship. So it's good. No, that's good. Although one thing that's funny, Evie. So <laughs> the, I don't know if you've been listening much, but at the beginning, I have uh, a random fact read out about yeah. me by my uh, uh, podcast editor, Jeremy. And uh, so when I did one of them about not liking citrus flavored things, I don't know if you listened to that one, but I got so many people reached out, how do you not like citrus? And I was just like, I just don't. And that seemed to be a conversation point for a while that we were like, you don't like citrus? I was like, no. <laughs> so it's so funny. I'm going to ask you, how can you not like citrus, Tina? <laughs> I, do, I just don't. Like, I, I mean... Uh. Lemony things, oranges? lemony things are okay. I hate orange flavored things or lime flavored things. Like I just hang on. Like I'll what eat like orange? a lemon tart or like a lemon cake okay. or something, but it would never be the one I would choose. But yeah. like I like citrus flavored like drinks or like citrus really anything. I'm not really. I don't know. I just I prefer like berry flavored things or like sugar flavored things. You know. With my <laughs> sweet tea. Sweet flavor things, not the, not the sour. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can't beat a good lemon drizzle cake, though, because the no. top's all sweet and sour. Mm. Lemon drizzle is good. I'll give you that. That was always my Nanny Jolly's favorite cake, and she oh. loved it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'll give you lemon drizzle. Although, this is way too much information and completely unrunning related. But as this is a bonus episode, if you're listening to this, you probably care. But. A few days ago, I decided I wanted to make a cake. I wanted to make a Mary oh. Berry recipe. Oh, yes. made, so I was like, oh, I'm going to make this Mary Berry cake. So I made the cake and I used, it said like eight egg yolks in the recipe. And she had like a caramel buttercream for wow. the frosting. And it said eight, eight egg yolks, but I put in eight eggs, not reading uh, the recipe probably. The cake uh, came out all like gummy-ish, like really like stodgy and Steve and I were like looking at each other like mm, this is okay but not great so uh, we both looked at each other and I was kind of like do you think and he was like yeah so we literally scraped all the like frosting the icing off the cake into a tub and then the next day I made the cake again and we threw away the <laughs> threw away uh, the old one but and you used the same frosting well I did okay, so. but then because he put like drew, Steve had like drawn stars and like covered it in writing <laughs> icing I think that um, made the frosting a little bit thinner. So then I put Uh the frosting on this new cake and now the frosting was pink because um, of this red icing that had like mixed in. And then I spread it over and then I went to kind of cut a piece like a few hours later and all all the sides had like slumped down so there was like a blob on the top and there was like a (laughs) puddle at the bottom and I was like well this cake just wasn't meant to be so so what was the cake? What was the what was it called? Well, I actually mixed two two recipes together, but the the <laughs> actual cake, the recipe, it was the caramel buttercream that was tempting us, and it was from a, a bake off, a British okay. bake off thing she did, and uh, it was I can't remember the name of it. it. Had a weird a weird name for the cake, but it looked really good. But apparently, I'm I'm not good enough with a, with cooking. But oh, um, what a shame! Well, yeah. you have to try it again. I will. I will. Trust me. That see that now that'll annoy me because I didn't do a very good job. So I'll have to like redo it. But anyway, okay, back to the point. One more thing I wanted to ask you about before we get back to running Mojo and stuff. What are your thoughts on like social media? So because I'm always talking about how like social media can be like really toxic for people about making us feel like bad about ourselves. Like if Mm. you scroll through your feed and all you see is this, I ran, you know, a 50, 50 minute PR. I did this, I did that. And like, if you're not feeling great about yourself, it can make you feel Mm. worse. What are your thoughts on like what to do about that? Yeah. 
Uh, it can. I'd say. I'd say avoid it. If, in that case, if it starts to make you feel really unhappy, and you know, just take a break, or perhaps just be really aware of why you you're even on social media and why you know you post your runs. Recent research shows that if you're part of a running community online and you know you post your runs and your your times, etc., yeah, and you're in a group, it does make you run faster and further. So people without realizing it or they might, but they are, they are competitive. And so, mm-hmm. and it can be, it can be motivating. You know, someone's just gone and done a six mile run through the forest and they've posted a fantastic run, you know, whatever the time was, feel great. It can give you that buzz. Oh, I'm not going to a run now, mm-hmm. um, which is great. And that's the positive side of social media. I think though, there's always a tendency to how much is too much. It's, mm. it's difficult to know, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, Personally, I use technology when I, I run sometimes, but not all the time. And I always try and have a balance. So I would say just be be mindful. Okay. Be aware. Do a little self-check. Mm, why am I going on here? Am I looking because it's making me feel good or am I looking because I want to make sure no one's run further than I have today? Just be careful. Okay. And, yeah, but it can be really motivating at the same time. So I spend a lot of time telling the community and and anyone I talk to really not to look at their Mm -hmm. pace during their running. And we call it, Mm -hmm. in the group, we call it hashtag no watch me. No watch Um, me, yeah. For not looking at your pace, you know, you can wear your watch, you can have it on, you can look at it after, but no looking during. You just run by feel. And Steve and I have now created marathon and half marathon training programs with no paces whatsoever, all done by feel. We explain exactly how. So we've taken it one step further and people are loving it so far. So it's been good. But what are your thoughts on why not knowing your pace is effective for runners rather than, you know, looking down every 10 seconds to make sure you're on the pace you wanted to run at? Mm, That's a good question too. And uh, there's a good answer to that. A friend of mine, and I'm sure he won't mind saying his name, Richard, he's he's in my, my triathlon club. The wheeled tri club, I have to say that. <laughs> so I was running with Richard the other day, and you know, it's triathlon season, and everyone's doing some racing, which is great. It's really exciting. It's the start of the season, and you know, Richard did a race on the weekend, last weekend, and and I think um, you know his watch broke. It just stopped. Um, I think at the start of the triathlon, so and he, he had to rely on his own feeling, exertion, etc. So that's a really good point. If you rely on technology, and then in the race you don't have it for whatever reason, you know, you have to be able to fall back on your intuition and instinct as well. So it's really important to train. I think um, I'm a big believer in you know, heart rate training, but also going by feel. And I haven't, I have to look at your plans, but you know, it might seem quite strange for a lot of people not to have that, that watch, which is a reassurance for them. But, you know, you can say, well, I'm going to go and run for half an hour without saying I'm going to go and run three miles. You can go by time instead and just start jogging and work through your paces and you will get familiar with where you're at. Mm-hmm. You know, do you find that with your Oh, with absolutely. Your and actually mm-hmm. most people who have tried it within one run, they're like, okay, I'm bought in. Because they realize, you know, if you run slower, then it's because your body needed to run slower. And, it, mm-hmm. and so often people will run faster than they thought they would. And if they'd known they were going that fast, they probably would have slowed down. And mm. so they actually ran faster. So I just feel like mentally it's, yeah, of mm. course you're wondering, am I running faster or slower? But like you said, it teaches you to mm. listen to your intuition. I just wondered yeah. if there was a mental part of this that like, is there anything that you would say that mm. means that you get a mental break from not like obsessing about it and thinking so about this, it? Yeah, no pressure, you know, you, because often you'll be at odds with the time. You, your body might be tired. You may you may not have had as much sleep that week and you're out there running and you, you want to be running seven and a half minute miles and it feels tough. And, you know, you first of all, you're looking at your watch. You're not focusing on your running. Again, you're probably not breathing as efficiently as you can be. Your form probably isn't as efficient as it could be because mm-hmm. you're distracted by that number. Mm-hmm. And then often you get frustrated because you think, oh, well, this is really hard and, and I'm not going as fast as I should be, you start shooting, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's, again, negative on your, can be quite detrimental to your performance. So I think mentally you take away the watch, at least for, you know, part of your runs um, and, you know, with your plans, I think it's a great idea mm-hmm. not to have a watch. I ran a marathon to New York marathon and I didn't even have a watch. I was a very, you know, green when it came to technology and, you know, all sorts of specific sessions. Mm-hmm. And 
I just mapped out a mile on a road and knew that was the mile and I'd run backwards and forwards. You know, that's the other thing, going the other way is often good. Mm. And, yeah, I was very – I became a good pacer because I got used to my – my ability and used to my exertion and used to my pace. So definitely. I'm no. glad you, you know, your plans are out there. I think yeah. that would be fantastic. No, I, I'm enjoying seeing how people are changing things and enjoying it. That's but, great. Yeah. Okay. For one more question I wanted to kind of area I thought we could talk about is mm-hmm. for people who kind of are struggling with motivation, they're in the middle of training and they're at that like tired point where they kind of lost their like mojo and they they're kind of mojo. like, Oh, I don't really want to do this. Like having a hard time staying motivated, just kind of falling off their training plan. Mm-hmm. What What would you say to that? What can they do to kind of get it back? Mm, I would so again do a, a check and think about what's going on in your life because sometimes there is stuff going on outside of your running that that can impact your motivation. You know, you might have some stuff going on with your family or work. Uh, there could be some stresses at work. So mentally, you know, you're taking more energy, putting more energy into other areas and you're finding that your running is is quite hard. I would, again, think about cross-training as well. So I know you believe in that. Mm-hmm. And, okay, your running's not going well. Well, just go for a swim. Take a break for a couple of days. You know, if you've got a coach, talk to your coach about it. Draw on your social support. So the people around you, your family or your running community, your friends, you know, talk about it and maybe speak to someone who inspires you even read a book that's inspirational or watch a, an inspirational video. That's always a really good thing for me. I think when I'm suffering with my, you know, low motivation, mm-hmm. but often it could be that actually think about your training plan. Am I doing too much? Where, where are my rest days? It could be something practical that you need to alter and it could be something going on outside of, uh, you know, your running. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, the point is take the pressure off yourself and, and give yourself that time to work it out. And you can always work it out. You know, you can always tweak things to either make more time in your routine, uh, in your week. You know, but if you're suffering and, you know, again, think about understanding why you're doing it, knowing what are you training for, mm-hmm. what are your goals, mm-hmm. is your goal something you really want? Do you need to look at changing your goals? Mm. All of those things, okay. which can be done. You know, yeah. it's not – People sort of have this fear of perhaps, oh, no, I've, I've got this race and I want to do it. But do you? you know, have a think about it. Be flexible. Very interesting and mm-hmm. great mm-hmm. advice there. Thank you. All right. Uh-huh. Um, so if someone uh-huh. wants to work with you, uh, maybe tell us about what you offer, where they can find out more information. Obviously, I'll put links in the show notes, but just kind of give us yeah. an overview. My website is mm-hmm. the place to go. Uh, no, I'm really pleased with it. So it's, my website is evieseventi.com. It's my name. And you can you know, at least find out more about me there and uh, the different things that I can offer in terms of my services. You can, you can email me at sportpsych at evieseventi.com. So that's my psychology web, my email. And, yeah, I think that's really really it. And so you offer like one-on-one sports psychology, like consultants? Oh yeah. So yeah, I, I do one-to-one. I do quite a lot of uh, Skype sessions with people, which is just amazing, you know, being in, in the UK and being able to work with people all around the world. In Lexington, uh, Kentucky. Hey, in Lexington, <laughs> Kentucky, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I get to see the sun shining in your country. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, so one to ones, you know, that's that's usually the way that I work. Um, I do do um, group work as well, and I'm actually teamed up with a friend who's an osteopath, and we did a, a mindful running oh, uh, cool. workshop. Hmm. Yeah, that was really good fun. She's a Pilates teacher as well, so we combined some Pilates, some uh, conditioning work, and some psychology work in a running workshop. Oh, so fun. they're really good fun. They're hmm. really good fun. That's great. And club work, so going to clubs and and speak to. Um, you know, clubs about pre-race performance, mm-hmm. uh, routines, strategies, and mental training tools, that sort of thing. But yeah, one-to-one in person or on Skype or phone or WhatsApp. All right. WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you want to be going that far. You'll be, uh, you'll be getting hundreds of people getting your phone number. Um, oh, that's <laughs> But we are not quite finished yet, Evie. We have the Running For Real 4. So if you could tell me maybe a unique nutrition tip or something that you like to use. Okay, my big... My big one is banana smoothie. I, so I make a smoothie before running. Mm-hmm. So make it up, natural yogurt, you know, soy, almond, any milk uh, that you can have, normal milk, 
cow's milk rather, not normal milk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whoops. Uh, a banana, <laughs> some honey, some frozen raspberries. So I buy fresh raspberries or strawberries, then I freeze them. And then when yeah. I want to make a smoothie, put a handful of those in, dollop of honey, some cinnamon, blend it all up, and then have a few slurps before my run and put it in the fridge. And I have that after my run. It's just mm. great because, you know, it's, it's a smoothie, it's cold, it's yeah, tasty. Yeah. You're making me crave a smoothie heavy. actually. I know. Yeah, I've really got to go really. make a smoothie. Yeah. Well, for you, that would be a strange little dinner having a smoothie, but. <laughs> for you, it would be. It's, coming, it up, it's coming up to lunchtime. So I could have a smoothie oh, yeah. for lunch. I can no, make a smoothie. It. Although I like making the smoothies so thick, Evie, that like you eat them out of the bowl yeah like (laughs) i don't really yeah i love them uh being like almost like well like ice cream consistency so i will put like all frozen stuff in there like barely any liquid because i like it being really thick wow yeah no i like to have that it's got to come through go through a straw it's got to pass the straw test (laughs) (laughs) well there you go uh we'll see what uh the listeners like if they like the you should tell us either tweet at us or send us a message as to what kind of smoothie you like maybe that'll be the question of the week uh for my, for my community all right so a running for real moment so a moment where you were maybe embarrassed or just like a moment that only runners would understand mm. embarrassed or like sad or like an amazing moment something where like you were like oh only runners would understand this yeah so um i think crossing the line, <laughs> crossing the line of a, of a 10 K where you've, you've run really hard and it's been really uncomfortable mm-hmm. and you, you, know, you, you, you did have those moments in the race where you just thought, Oh, this isn't great. I'm not feeling great. And you cross that line and that feeling of all elation, all of that, you know, discomfort and those that anxiety that you had in the race and all of that hard work that you put in, it just completely gets over overridden with that just that feeling mm. of, of joy, um, you know, fatigue as well. But it's a great feeling. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Arms uh, up. Woo. Yeah, I love putting <laughs> arms up. And um, another yeah. one. So this is going to be probably a pretty similar thing, but a high moment for you. Something that was maybe a career highlight. Oh, a career highlight was was um, you know passing my masters, my dissertation, and and being able to tell myself that I'm a sports psychologist. Mm-hmm. I think that was, I really worked, I'm, I am still working, but really worked, uh, yeah, put a lot did. of effort in. And yeah, it's been a long road and I'm just enjoying it, really yeah, enjoying right. it. Yeah. Yeah. You did so well. And finally, um, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line? What do I tell myself? Run your own race. Good. That's good advice. All right. So Evie, the last thing I will say to you is I ask Mm. my guests to send me a photo of your power pose. So that's you, how you would stand on the start line to build your confidence. So will you take a picture or send us a picture if you already have one of you doing your power pose? Absolutely. Okay. All right. I got it right. Yeah, I know what it is. You know it. (laughs) Okay, my dear friend, it was amazing talking to you and uh, I hope everyone else has enjoyed it. I am sure they will be checking out your website. I will put links again in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash Evie, E-V-I-E. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And I'm really, really happy to have been able to chat with you and all of all of your running community and your, yeah, your followers and our followers. It's yep. been great. So everyone, I hope to, to speak with you sometime online or in person and have a great weekend. Yep. Thanks, Thank Tina. Thanks. I don't know how anyone cannot absolutely just love that woman. She is just amazing. She's built a special place in my heart. And I know you guys are just going to love her. But so much of what she said was just so helpful today. And I know that I would have benefited so much if I knew this years ago before I started really struggling with the mental side of things. And as I mentioned in the episode, Evie really was the one who turned things around for me. Like, I can't thank her enough for all that she's done. We will be putting links to everything we talked about today in the show notes which again are at tinamuir.com forward slash ev and you can find everything you need there in addition to the facebook community in addition to the marathon and half marathon training programs and anything else that we talked about in the show so we do have another episode coming on friday so you can look forward to that one but for now this is you know a one-off bonus episode on a wednesday And again, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and then you will get it directly to your phone or podcast player without having to go search for it. That's probably the easiest way to do things. 
And once again, I want to thank anyone who has shared or put the word out about this podcast. It really, really means so much and I really appreciate it. You guys are the best. So I hope you have a wonderful National Running Day and I will see you on Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.